Okay, hello there, and welcome to part three of my tutorial for Dominions 4. Now, in this episode, we're going to be talking about units, stats, and commanders. Now, units are like the main thing in this game. Without units, you wouldn't have any magic, you wouldn't have any armies, and you wouldn't be able to create a large dominion, because you'd have no way of push pushing forward your borders, you'd have no way of defending them. So units are an incredibly important thing. Now, I'm going to show you the recruitment. Uh, view, which you can get to by either clicking this button here or by pressing the R button, and that will show you where you can recruit units. Now you can recruit units at any province that you own. Now um, you've got your own national units here which you can recruit at any place where you have a castle or a fortress. Anything like that and you'll be able to create a unit. If you don't have a castle or a fortress, you'll be able to recruit the provincial units, which are going to be things like uh, barbarian tribes, etc, etc. Just kind of stuff like that, and perhaps not as good, but maybe sometimes you want them, because for example, uh, say with Niflheim, which we are, we have no real archer units. So if we ever wanted archers, we'd have to recruit some uh, some archers from a provincial uh, unit, because we have nobody who can use bows. So, yeah, if we ever wanted archers in our army, we'd have to recruit them from a province uh, that spawned archers. Now, after you build a castle on one of those things, you can still uh, produce those original units. You can produce those units on top of the units you already have, or that are your national units. So, yeah, that's units. Now, units all cost different amounts. All units pretty much cost gold and resources. Now the amount of resources and gold it costs differs between the units. For example, uh, our Jota Militia here costs 20 gold and 17 resources. If we go up to our Spearmen, which are a little bit better than our uh, our Militia, then they are 30 gold, 17 resources. Same resources, but you know, you're spending a bit of extra gold. It could be for more armor, it could be for better weapons, etc, etc. If we go up to here, usually the way it works is the further right it is, the more uh, the more elite the unit is. So usually the further right you go, the more the unit costs, and the more resources it costs. Not necessarily, but that's usually the case. For example, our Huskars here, or Huskars, here costs 35 gold and 23 resources. You know, that's more per militia. But you'd probably get more bang for your buck out of these guys than you with the militia. Not necessarily, because uh, it doesn't matter how expensive a unit is. If it only has slightly better armor and it gets hit by an arrow, it's going to die just like any other sort of militia unit. So you've got to kind of think of the... Uh, the cost to effective weight, uh, cost to effectiveness ratio. So, yep, so you've got your Huska, Huskarls here. Now, um, depending on what unit you have, these units are both the same. This one has a slight less resource cost, and that's because they have different weapons. This one has an axe, this one has a spear. You can see it from the sprite. The Herdman is like kind of the elite of the elite of our normal forces. It costs 40 gold and 33 resources per unit. That's a lot of gold. That's a lot of gold for a single unit. But you've got to see if it's worth it. Nifilim Giants, which you can already see are quite a bit taller than anything else, they cost 155 gold and 23 resources. Now you're thinking, whoa, that's a huge investment. And you're right, that is a huge investment. However, there are some things that make units worth it a little bit more. Now, you can see here that this unit is actually sacred. Now we'll get onto what sacred units mean. Sacred units uh, kind of like are the elite of the elite, you know, they are fanatical to your god, and they have special bonuses that come to them. Yeah, do you remember from our first part, uh, the, um, the bless bonuses? When you bless your sacred units, they get those bonuses, and that can make sacred units very, very powerful. Sacred units also uh, have less upkeep than any of your other units. All units require a certain number of gold per turn to upkeep them, you know, pay their wages, pay for the food, etc, etc. So, Sacred units pay half of that. Uh, I'm not sure how we'd be able to check that just now. We'll go into that when we get into stats. Uh, so, the difference is when recruiting things that are sacred, is they also cost holy points. Now, what holy points are, are points that you get depending on your current level dominion, and they reduce the amount of sacred units or mages that you can build. I, I'm not sure if it is mages, it could just be sacred. Uh, usually the mages are possibly sacred, depending on it. Definitely the higher level ones are usually sacred, and some races have only sacred mages. So really it just depends on what race you're playing. So yeah, 
Holy points are based on your dominion, and so we'd be limited to at most creating six Nifhel giants, even if we had the money, and even if we had the resources available to make seven, we'd only be able to recruit six per turn. Finally, there's also this one, Jotun Skin Shifter. Now this one has a special thing in that you can only recruit a maximum of five per month. Now this is because it's a special one, because obviously uh, you can see from skin shifting, Tag, it manages to change shape into something else, uh, but we'll go into that later when we get into attributes. Now, equipment. Let's go into equipment. Equipment is what you see down here. There's their weapons and their armor. Don't worry, these are the stats here. We're going to go in there for a second. Now, usually with a higher gold and higher resource cost, you get better stats, better weapons, and better armor. Now, things like uh, weapons, you know, weapons are quite important because it all depends on things like the length of a weapon. The length of a weapon means how easy it is to repel with a weapon. We'll get into that in a second. The attack is how much uh, extra skill this uh, or the attack value that uh, someone gets for using this weapon, which uh, you think you add your attack skill onto. The damage is how much damage that weapon will do uh, before armor. Now armor, armor all has protection stats. Now you see your leather armor, reinforced leather cap, and that gives an average protection. We'll go, to, yeah, it's an average protection of 13. So you take off 13 points of damage if someone was hit. Now, you've also got shields, which in themselves have a, obviously a lot higher protection than any of the armor, but that protection only works if you're able to parry, and parry is based off of your, uh, I think it's your defense skill, as well as your parrying ability. So this is going a little bit into stats, but, uh, you know, it's fine, it's fine. So, um, each weapon can have different damage types. For example, this axe here has slash damage. If we went and looked at our spearman, he has piercing damage. Now, some weapons have two types of damage. Uh, I'm going to see if any of these guys do actually have any. It seems they all have slashing and piercing. Uh, here we are, boulders. So, this guy throws boulders, and that does blunt damage. Those are the three major normal types of damage. There's also magical damage. And, uh, you know, fire damage, uh, lightning da shock damage, sorry, uh, frost damage, etc, etc. So those are all very important. Now, we're going into the meat and bones of this episode, and that's going to be stats. Now, the way I like to remember stats is there's two categories of stats. There's important stats, like the incredibly important per unit stats. And those are hit points, attack skill, Defense skill, morale, oh, where's morale? There it is, and protection. Now, so what hit points are, are they are the number of, uh, well, basically the amount of damage that a unit can take before it dies. Unless it has the undying trait, in which case, well, hey, you know, you get to live for a bit longer. But yes, hit points, so this unit has, this Jotun Militia, has 30 hit points. It'll be able to take 30 points of damage before it keels over, and that's it dead. Next up is attack skill. Now, attack skill uh, indicates the unit's ability to hit somebody in melee combat. So, um, it basically, you roll a dice uh, to see if you're able to hit an opponent. And that's all based on your attack skill. Now, your attack skill is reduced per weapon if you're uh, wielding more than one, unless you have the ambidextrous trait. So, uh, people who uh, have two weapons will get two attacks per turn. They're less likely to hit them with it because their attack skills are going to be reduced. Now, attack skill is also quite important with the length. This is to do with repelling. So there's three different ways. There's only really one way you can attack with the attack skill, and that's just by swinging your weapon at someone uh, or shooting at them. Though that also comes under precision. Uh, so you swing your weapon at someone, and they have three ways to defend. First of all, they can dodge, and that's based on their defense skill. So that's their ability to kind of you know weave out the way and try and avoid taking damage. Next, uh, they can repel the attack. And that's based on your attack skill and the length of your weapon. The longer the weapon, the better chance you have of repelling away the attack. Um, it might not be like knocking it away, it might be keeping them far away enough that even though they would have landed the attack, they can't get into range to get it. Say if you had a spear, for example, a very long weapon. You know, someone's trying to attack you with an axe, say. It's a, quite a short weapon, or a shorter weapon. Uh, and they can't, just can't get into range because you're too busy like keeping them uh, keeping them away using your spear. Finally, there's the ability to parry, and that's by using s shields and I think defense skill. 
Uh, yes. So that's using your defense skill and your parry. And your... My, my apologies. Shields are based on your defense skill uh, and your ability to parry with them. So each unit has a different ability to parry. I think your parry is about half of your defense skill, and I think you take a minus to your defense skill for having a shield, because obviously a shield's big and bulky. It's hard to dodge things when you have one, but if you don't dodge them, you've still got a big ass shield to keep, you know, that sword away from your face. Which is always quite nice. Now, morale. Morale is the, uh, how courageous, how brave a unit is. So, every, a unit will t check its morale, as it says here, every time it receives damage or if a member of its squad dies. So, every single time an individual loses morale, it reduces the morale of your entire squad. So, like, the probability that a squad will route will base on the total squad morale reduction and its current size. So a larger squad, even if it's taken quite a lot of losses, if it's large enough, it'll still keep together because it's like... You maybe have one person who's cowering in fear, but there's another 80 men to fight in his place. Whereas, if there's 10 men, and two of them want to run, the rest of the guys will be going, Yeah, I think this is a good idea. So, morale really only works for uh, living units. Uh, Undead, um, yeah, undead, sort of lifeless, mindless monsters don't have a morale of 50, so it means they'll never run away, but if they don't have a commander, though, they'll, they'll dissolve on the battlefield. Commanders can run. Um, there's a special rule that any army will run if it takes 75% of its troops as losses. So, say if you had uh, 100 troops, a couple of commanders, if you lost about 80 men, all troops would run then. Because they've just taken a crushing defeat, they've lost so many men. Doesn't matter if you're winning the battlefield, doesn't matter if you've killed like three times the amount of people you've lost. At that point, the banners are broken, you know, they're putting up the white flag and they're retreating from the battlefield. So... All units will leave the battlefield as well, if all commanders are dead. Or if the commanders have left the battlefield. If there's no commanders on the field, uh, they will all retreat unless they've gone berserk. If they've gone berserk, then they will stay on the battlefield and keep fighting. Just because they're in such a fit of rage, you know, they don't even know what's happening anymore. They're just going to keep on fighting and they're just going to die on the battlefield as they'd want to. Our last one that we've got to talk about is protection. So protection is the thickness of any armor worn and the protection value is subtracted from the attack strength and weapon damage when calculating the total effective damage on a target. Now, you do have some weapons that are armor piercing, for example, crossbow bolts. Crossbows are very, very deadly, uh, especially when you get into the later game when everybody's suited out in big, you know, chunky armor. A crossbow bolt can go straight through that, and you know, it takes uh, an armor piercing bonus, so it reduces the protection by a certain amount. But overall, protection is really important. Now, the only thing with protection is it comes on to a secondary attribute, which is fatigue, or sorry, encumbrance. So encumbrance is the number of, uh, num the number that your fatigue increases for every round that your unit's on the battlefield for. So for example, if this uh, unit here was just moving, it would take three fatigue per turn. If they're in melee, they'll take five fatigue per turn. Fatigue, um, is something that comes up and, you know, adds up and adds up and adds up. So, as a unit's fatigue increases, it, uh, they're easier to hit, you know, their defense skill goes down, it's hard for them to parry, I think it's also harder for them to attack. So, uh, once it exceeds 100, the unit falls down to the ground unconscious, you know, they're just completely exhausted. Um, so yeah, fatigue is a bit, it's quite important, it's not like the most important thing when you're thinking about your units because, you know, it's all about your encumbrance. But yeah, fatigue does have a very special place in uh, in battle. For example, you can bring down a horrible dragon just with uh, a militia if by the end of the battle the dragon is just completely tired out uh, and the militia hasn't run away. So if the dragon ever runs, uh, exceeds 100 fatigue, then it will just stop fighting, become exhausted, and the militia can pretty much uh, just cut it apart while it's asleep. Or unconscious, rather. So, other than that, you've also got uh, morale, 
sorry, not morale, sorry, magic resistance, they're right above, you know, it's right above them, you know, the similar numbers, they start with M, you gotta, gotta cut me some slack, so magic resistance is um, the likelihood that the unit will resist spells, like mind affecting spells, uh, you know, charm spells, um, alteration spells that will destroy your armor, grip you into the ground, etc, etc. This doesn't usually work for destructive things like fireball, because fireball does fire damage. That's not magic, it's not technically magical damage. That's fire damage. You're summoning a huge ball of fire using magic, but it's the fire that does the damage and not the magical part of it. So magic resistance is quite important because, uh, you know, if you're, um, if your army's, you know, fighting against uh, Iphalids, for example, or Olms, which have things like Mind Burn, if they don't uh, roll their magic resistance against that sort of thing, their mind will be burned and, you know, they're pretty much dead. Or completely feebled. Feeble-minded. Or the brain just doesn't work anymore and they're just completely, you know, destroyed. I think it does instantly kill because it's like your brain just melts out your ears, so obviously you can't even breathe or do anything like that because your medulla's just stopped working. So uh, other than that, there's strength. Now strength influences uh, how much damage that you do. So a high strength makes your da weapon do more damage and makes it easier to punch through other people's armor. Strength is a relatively important thing, but not that important. Precision. Precision is actually probably the one of the things that we don't have to worry about that much as Niflheim. We don't really have very many ranged units. So precision represents how skilled they are at targeting. So they only use it when casting spells or firing missile weapons. The higher it is, the more chance it's going to hit the target. So you know, basically how good your eyes is, how, how good you are at uh, judging distances, etc, etc. Um, there is movement, and there's two different types of movement. There's battle movement and map movement. So each unit has a certain number of action points that's limited to the extent the unit can move and attack each turn. So it, um, when the unit runs out of action points, it can no longer do anything. Uh, so, for example, our giants have, well, our militia giants have a basic action point of 15 and it's reduced to 13. I think that's due to the amount of armor we're wearing. So, you know, it's got 13 uh, points worth of action. I think, you know, you can use one to move a certain tile, or is it two to move a certain tile? I can't exactly remember. You use a certain number to move into a tile, you move, use a certain number to attack, you use a certain number to defend, to parry, etc, etc. So, you know, eventually, you, there's such a thing as bogging down a unit where they can no longer attack, they can no longer uh, move, just because they're spending all of their time just dodging. Because they're trying to dodge away from danger, so they're running out of their ta uh, ta Oh, sorry. Action points, not attack points. They're running out of their action points. And that means that they can no longer attack. So, you know, you've got to watch out for that. There is also uh, size. Size affects um, generally the amount of hit points you have, although it can be several other things, you know, uh, uh, things to do with training, things to do with age, could decrease it, uh, what race they are, etc. So, for example, we've got size 4. So, um, size also bears into effects when it comes in to units that trample, for example, elephants. The smaller a unit is than the one who's trampling, the more damage they will take from trampling. So humans, who are size 2, usually, would take a lot of damage from an elephant. Even more damage would be taken by pygmies, who are size 1, or gnomes, or dwarves. You know, they would take a lot of damage from an elephant charging over them. The giants, not quite as much. They would probably still die to a rampaging elephant, but they can take a little bit more of a beating. You know, maybe the elephant won't kill as many units per turn, because it'll get stuck, because it won't have killed one of the units, for example. Uh, and then finally, if we go back to fatigue, there's a thing called age. Now, the more, the older a unit is... Oh, excuse me. Gosh, I'm yawning far too much. So yeah, the more aged a unit is, the more it, uh... The closer it gets to be being old age. When you're old age, you start to get uh, things, for example, um, diseases, you know, you'll or afflictions. So what afflictions are is afflictions are sort of things where you can lose like an arm, and it'll say like this unit has lost an arm, and you know you've got this negative effects with it. 
Uh, you, obviously you've lost an arm so you can't use a shield or anything like that, or you can only use a shield or a weapon, you can't use both. Um, you'll get a reduction to your attack skill, you'll get a reduction to your defense skill, because obviously you're kind of, uh, you're no longer sort of center of mass, because now you're missing an arm, you know, that makes a makes a big difference to, you know, your ability to fight. You've learned this entire time how to fight with two hands, and now you got to fight with one of them. So obviously you're not going to be quite as good as you were before. Uh, disease, there's diseases as well, diseases make it so that, you know, you lose uh, a tenth of your maximum hit points per month, so after ten months your unit will die from the disease, and that's not a very nice way to go. So old age, wouldn't recommend it, uh, if you can not be old, do, uh, but until then, you know, it's fine. So, as well as stats, there are things called special attributes. We'll use the Jota Militia for now. You know, this special attribute here, cold resistant. Damage from the cold and frost are reduced by this number of points, so we get 15 less damage from the cold. That's pretty goddamn good. It means that our units are able to, are very easily able to uh, fight against things like uh, chill effects, you know, where snow wraps around, or if it's snowing. It means also, because, um, we're, we're obviously fighting Cold 3. We will not take as much fatigue as the enemy will take in fati as fatigue. Because uh, we're you we're, we live in Cold 3. So we're used to fighting in Cold 3. We don't mind fighting in Cold 3. So say if we're playing against the uh, the Satis, which are like Lizard Kings. Um, if their Lizards had a fight in uh, the Cold, the only would be a disadvantage because they... Um, they're used to being very warm, but they're also cold-blooded, so they take a lot more fatigue per turn than our troops. Uh, sorry about that, my phone is ringing. I'll have to uh, just leave that there. God damn it, Mum! You know I'm busy recording. You can't be. Uh, you can't be phoning me right now. So yes, um, other things that there are uh, for our hurlers, they get a siege bonus because uh, they inc they inc count as five units per unit of uh, Jotun hurlers. That's because you know. They carry huge, massive boulders that they just lob at the walls. They're pretty much like siege units. Or catapults, something like that. So, now we'll go on to our giants. Now, these guys are quite interesting. You can see here, these guys are sacred, which we've talked about before. Uh, we'll just go into it. Sacred units are extremely devoted to the gods because they can be blessed and only require half the usual cost to maintain. As I said, now, these guys are... Tw they are 25 cold resistance, so they take 25 points of damage less from cold spells. They are, however, susceptible to fire. So, they, uh, they take five points extra of damage from fire, because, you know, obviously they're pretty much made of ice. Um, so they take more damage from fire, and if they get set on fire, you know, it's much more easy for them to die, because they'll take a lot of da more damage per turn. These guys have chill around them. The creature is surrounded by unnatural cold. The cold is most intense during snowy, snowy weather and in cold provinces. So, right now, the chill will do 10 points of cold damage around the unit. Now, the unit doesn't take any damage because he's already got the 25 cold resistance. If, say, you set a mage to cast himself a spell to set himself on fire, and he had no fire resistance, he would kill himself. Because he would take fire damage every turn. He's not resistant to it, why would he be? So, you know, you've got to be careful about this thing. You've also be careful about when you're setting up your army, uh, how you're going to do it, uh, and make sure that anybody who isn't cold resistant is away from anybody who does cold damage or fire damage. You know, this fire version of chill where it's like heat and it radiates heat around you, does damage to people uh, around you with fire damage. Um, cold power, this unit is more powerful than cold provinces. So the cold of the province is, the more powerful the unit is. It gets a stat bonus for being in cold provinces. However, if the province is warmer, the the unit starts to get weaker. So, you know, you've got to kind of balance out and make sure that you're always fighting cold provinces if you're going to use these Nephile Giants. Uh, they also get ice protection, so this unit will have a higher protection value than colder provinces. Warm pr provinces will reduce the protection value instead, so that's because, like, their armor is pretty much made of ice. So, you know, the colder provinces, the more solidified the ice is, and the warmer the province is, you know, it pretty much just melts away. Interesting thing, water elementals, if they are in below, I think, a cold or cold 2 province or below, they will become ice elementals. 
because the water freezes. That gives them much higher protection, but a lot less movement. So, you know, it's really kind of interesting details like that, you know, that you wouldn't make sense, but you'd never think of, like, actually doing. So, yeah, those are the G Nifal Giants. There's also the Skin Shifter. Sh uh, skin Shifters. These guys have the regeneration. 10%. So, regenerative creatures heal some of their wounds after every combat round, and they have a reduced with risk of getting permanent afflictions. Lifeless beings are not affected by regeneration. So these guys will regenerate 10% of their maximum hit points per turn during any battle, until the battle's finished. There's two types of regeneration. There's regeneration like this, that'll just keep going, and then there's limited regeneration, where I think you can get... Uh, you can regenerate a certain amount of hit points, like you, re re can, you can regenerate up to half of your hit total hit points and then you stop regenerating. You've just taken too much damage, any more damage you get won't be regenerated. So now the interesting thing about the skin shifter is um, they don't actually have a, a shape changing ability, but if you read the flavor te text here, a skin shifter is a warrior of the wild who wears an enchanted wolf skin that allows the wearer to change shape into a beast wolf. When the skin is bloodied, the wearer, wearer howls in pain and rage and is forced to take beast form. The enchanted skin gives the warrior regenerative powers. So, the interesting thing about this is, they have no ability to change shape, because it's not them that does the ability change, or the, the change in shape. It's all about the furs that they wear. The furs are the ones that give them the ability to change shape, so they don't have any kind of bonuses to their character. They also have forest survival. Remember all those different types of the map you can get? You know, forest, mountains, swamps, waste? Certain units have abilities, like this one, uh, to survive better in those provinces. So forest survival means they can move through forest provinces without any penalty, like they were just plain grassland, and they are less likely to starve when the army runs out of supplies in these provinces. I think they also uh, reduce the amount of supplies they need in those provinces as well. So, you know, those survival things are very, very useful, especially if you have, uh, you know, an army that's mostly fighting in forests, like barbarians, you know, hit and run kind of guys that can move pretty far. Those are the things you want. Now we're going to go on to our commanders and explain some of the special uh, attributes there. So, for example, we got shape changing for the Scratty here. You know, they can change into Jotun werewolves. They can change shape at any time. It's not like those guys with the furs. They can just sh change shape whenever they want. Um, as well as that, there's uh, things uh, such as stealthy. Now, normal units can be stealthy as well, and those can be really, really useful because they allow you to do sneak attacks. For example sneaking a stealthy army into a province of the enemy and then just attacking them without any warning. Like they don't know you're on the borders, they don't know you're in the province, you'll be able to attack their troops or get behind their uh, front lines and then attack them from behind. So stealthy units can be very, very useful. Now what else? This, For example, this guy has uh, forest survival and mountain survival. So they're able to move through mountains without any penalty. That's insanely good. They're also able to move through mountain passes when it is too cold to do so, usually. So you know, uh, usually you can't move through mountains if it's too cold, like from one side of a mountain to the other. If it's not uh, very cold, like if it's, even if it is cold, with somebody with mountain survival can still move through the mountain pass. Because you know, they've kind of grown up there, you know, they know everything about it. What else is there to talk about with commanders? Um, other than, you know, obviously their stats. Uh, I'm trying to think of any special ones. Uh, the Gieja, the special one here. Death Cursed. Anyone killing this being will be cursed the rest of their life. It's not possible to resist this. And Cursed means they are more likely to take permanent afflictions. You know, bad things are happening to them. Let's see what else. The, these Nifel Jarls are kind of just the same as the Giants, except, you know, obviously better equipped. Um, other than that, there's not really anything. So I think we can just go into commanders. So commanders usually have slightly better stats than your usual troops. Maybe not quite, but usually. But you don't really want them fighting too much, unless you're actually actively thugging out a commander. Commanders come in a few types. There are your troop leaders, which are here, which have a very important thing called leadership. Leadership is the amount of normal units that are... Uh, a unit can lead, or a commander can lead into battle. You know, this uh, guy here, the uh, the Jotun Jarl, Jarl, sorry, can lead 80 troops. Uh, and units are split into three categories. There's normal units, 
undead or demon units, and then magical beings. This guy can only lead normal units, so he can only lead humans, or uh, in this case, giants. Um, he cannot lead any undead or any demons, uh, it means he can't summon any either, because obviously he just doesn't have the ability to command them, he'd summon them, they'd instantly just fall to the ground, although I think you get a bonus the amount of undead troops you can lead per death level you have. I'll have to look that up. Uh, and then magical beings. If Usually if you're a mage you can lead magical beings. We'll go to one of our mages here and see how many magical beings they can lead. So yeah, like our Gaija can lead 10 magical beings, 35 undead, or demons, or 40 units. Now, so those are your leaders. Then you have things like priests. So priests have the priest level which allow them to cr uh, cast holy spells. Holy spells are uh, completely different from any kind of magic. You already know all the holy spells you can possibly cast, but you can only cast... Uh... Oh, excuse me again. Obviously, it's just far too early in the morning for this. Um, yeah, priest levels will never go up. Unless they become your prophet, priest levels will never go up without the use of like unique mag magical artifacts. And it's kind of just a waste to give them to like your level 2 priests, for example, when you could be getting really high level, like level 5 holy spells. Those are things that like increase the uh, ability of any minor priest, anybody with one level in priest, on the map, on your side, until the battle is over. You know, they're pretty, pretty goddamn good. Um, so there's priests, then you've obviously got your mages, those are people with uh, magical powers who can do research, etc. And then you've got your spies, the ones who are stealthy, the ones that can go into other territories without necessarily having to attack it and be able to get information. Now the thing with stealth is, you know, it has a number, for the example 40, and so the value is an estimate of the number of patrols required to have a 50% chance of discovering the stealthy unit. So you need about 40 patrols to have a 50% chance, so 20 patrols you'd have about... 25, probably slightly less, more like 20 chance, because you know, uh, the more patrols you have, the, the sort of like it compounds. Because obviously the more patrols you have, the more people you've got looking at it, it just keeps on increasing and increasing. The less patrols you have, the less ground you can cover. And it's more easy for people to get away, because you know, if there's one guard coming down the street instead of like five different groups of guards going down different streets all converging on one location, that's going to be a lot harder to get away from. Now, what else? Hmm, so we've talked about spies, we've talked about commanders, we've talked about priests, and we've talked about mages. So, yep, you know, mages can uh, all have different magical paths. For example, the Gaija have, uh, you know, death magic, nature magic, blood magic, and then there's two random magical skills. Now that means they're guaranteed to get two random skills if we go into that. They've got 100% of getting a plus one level in either astral, death, nature, or blood. So the game's gonna roll the dice, 100%, they get one level, rolls one of those, you know, one to four basically, picks one of those, or picks one from what roll it got, moves on to the next one, it's got 100% chance, rolls, obviously it's gonna get it, rolls a one die four, you know, see which ones it gets, it could get like an astral and another level in death magic, and then it goes on to the third one. This one has a 10% chance, so the likelihood of a gaiju getting another level in magic is about one in ten. Uh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, percentages, woohoo, I can actually do them. Uh, so yeah, that, and then if that is successful, then it rolls a 1 die 4 and adds on one of these magical paths. If it's not successful, nothing happens, uh, and the guy just stays the little magical level it is. Now, Gaija are quite interesting, because, you know, uh, they, all, they obviously start as old age, you know, they start at 330, they start like, the start of old age was at 300, so they get minus one to their strength, minus one to their attack, minus one to their defense, nothing to precision, plus one to encumbrance, minus 5% HP, and minus 5% AP. And you know, that's quite interesting to see. Now, uh, the research ability of your mages determines how much research points per turn those units are going to give to, you know, your research pool. And your research pool is, if you remember the last part, is how you research new levels in your spells. Um, and if we go onto the giant jar, you'll see there's a quite interesting thing when we mouse over him, in that he is slow to recruit. That means instead of, and the same with the Scratty here, that means 
instead of only taking one turn to recruit, it takes two turns to recruit. Now you've got to think to yourself, is it worth it, for example, recruiting two Gaijas in the same space of time I can recruit one Scratty or one Jarl? And obviously the knife Nifilem Jarl is really expensive. 525 gold and 43 resources. You can make a, like a small amount of troops for that. Probably make about 10 troops for that amount of gold. But he is definitely worth it. And we're going to be actually be using quite a bit of Jarls and a bit of Scratties and a bit of our werewolves and our Yijas, hopefully to bring us to victory. Now obviously he starts with the, uh, the random magic skill. He gets a 100% chance of getting one of these three paths, you know, air, water, or death, and then another 10% chance to get another level in air, water, or death. And that really all depends on your roles. And I think that's all we really have to say when it comes to units and stats and commanders. So uh, in the next part, you know, we're going to be talking about army setup, uh, recruitment, profits, uh, formation, scripting, army movements, battles, and we're finally going to start expanding. So you know, it's only taken me, how long must this, must this be? It's almost taken me about two hours before we've even gone past the first turn. But I want to make sure you guys all know exactly what to expect, all the different mechanics. You don't have to understand them right now. These are things you're going to pick up over time as you play the game. But um, yeah, I just want to make sure you guys pick up on all the kind of interest all the special parts of Dominions that I definitely love. Sorry, I can't speak today. I can never speak today. I always can't speak and I'm trying to say incentricities? You know, something like that. You know you know the word I'm trying to say. I know the word I'm trying to say. I hope you do too. But anyway, I want to say thank you to everybody who's watching this. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, if it's been informative, please give us a like, give us a subscribe. Um, if you think that you know, you know anybody who'd want to see this, you know, please just show it to them. Uh, they don't have to like it. You know, you don't have to base your friendships over who likes me. Uh, that's what I'd like to do, but it's not what you have to do. But uh, I can't wait to see you guys for part four, and hopefully that'll be soon. But until then, I'll see you next time, and goodbye.